Hello to everyone. Well, wonderful to have you all online and uh, we really are excited. It was 2017 that Willem and I did our first roadshow and we had such amazing feedback from everyone around the world actually. So not just in South Africa, but all over the world. And as Ken said, you know, his friends in England couldn't believe that they got to speak to someone who actually has been to space. So Willem, it's awesome to have you online tonight. And uh, you always bring such a such an eloquent uh, discussion around the future technology, but bring it into the present. So wonderful to have you tonight. Well, thanks very much for having me, Scott. Nice to be back and looking forward to this evening. Awesome. And Lee, just uh, to your side, thank you very much for uh, putting on tonight and, and getting it all set up uh, for our community. We really appreciate it. As I said, you know, these are the sessions we want to put together, which is all about adding value to the community. So thanks, Lee, for putting it all together. Absolutely. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, there's so many people that are on tonight, so thank you for joining us. I'm sure that you are joining us from all four corners of the world, so please could you find the chat box and just let us know where you're joining us from. Say hi. It's the same box that you're going to be using to ask questions um, throughout the webinar, so please feel free to pop your questions in there. I will put Willem and Scott in the hot seat and make sure that they answer your questions, but we are super excited. We've had an overwhelming response um, to this webinar. So I hope that our panelists are ready for everything that we are going to throw at them. So just having a quick look here, we've got people that are joining us from Durban, from France, from Kenya, McGregor, Stellenbosch, Saudi, another one from France, Australia, Tennessee. Gosh, we definitely have people from all over the place. So welcome, everybody. I'm going to hand back to Scott and we look forward for a very powerful webinar. Brilliant. So just before I get started, I just wanted to say that we're running a series of webinars over the next couple of weeks on how to be financially resilient in the current COVID-19 economic environment. We are literally starting this webinar tonight with Willem around where the world is and where it's going. And I just wanted to thank our partners, so Calio Capital, our family office that help 85 of the wealthiest families in South Africa and America. We've got American Dream that has helped over 400 people immigrate to America through the EB-5 program. Uh, many people you know, like Martin Freeman and Hilda Lundestead, they've all gone through American Dream. And then Cashbox that really helps people invest in very good quality structured notes. Now, they're a highly sophisticated investment instrument that I'd never heard of until 12 months ago. Family offices invest in them all the time. But what they've done is now make them available, just like we've made buildings, medical buildings and whatever available by using technology. So welcome to all our partners on this journey. From Willem's perspective, you know, you all got the invite and uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction. And then what Willem and I have agreed is I'm going to set the scene for about 10 minutes tonight. Then I'm going to hand over to Willem. We are running a tight clock tonight due to load shedding, believe, believe it or not. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, Willem's going to run a session and then I'm actually going to, uh, him and I are going to come together in conclusion to take what he's talking about and where the future's going and some of the opportunities that present ourselves today. So just to give you a little bit of an intro to him, he's a chartered accountant by background. He was one of the youngest partners at Deloitte's. He spent the first stage of his career in financial services and then became the managing partner of Center for the Edge that was an exponential technology and innovation unit that really focused on you know, discovering new models and commercial opportunities. He's done quite a lot with early thinking around reusing space rockets and you know, most people, want, all my team want to know how you got to space, Willem. Brought Singularity University through to South Africa and upon leaving Deloitte's, which is about the time we actually met, he founded a technology venture capital firm that invests in exponential organizations. So it really is um, awesome to have you here tonight, Willem. And, you know, this story is one that very few people get to meet people like yourself. And what I mean by that is we all get to read the books about technology, but few people have got to experience it like you have, including seeing so many companies with Deloitte's, you know, other companies with Deloitte's and later with your venture capital firm of people that are actually doing it. You know, it's all good and well to learn about the theory, but actually doing it. Spot on, Scott. And, I, you know, something that, I, if I could just share some of my own learnings, you mentioned that I'm a CA. I will say I'm a reformed TA. I think I've forgotten every single thing that they've taught me in university. But interestingly, one of the things that I've seen is that in mature investment space, it's all about the financial model and finding adequate MBA grade people to, to mature those value models and extract as much value from it as possible. 
in early stage, uh, to my surprise, it's actually a lot less about the, uh, the sorted outness of the financial model and a lot more around the, the people aspect. In other words, are you backing a founder who when the going gets tough will find a way to persist and persevere? And so it's way more of a human capital game earlier on in investment stage than it is in late stage. And, and that to me was actually quite a surprise. And through that, I've met the most amazing people over the last four years as my journey from corporate had gone into um, eating only what I kill. Mm. No, fantastic. And it, it's a very good interlude. I know you're going to talk about your company, Offinet, and, and the link between artificial intelligence and, and the whole digital marketing and everything else. Yes. But I just wanted to steal two of your slides before, before I hand over to you. And, and you know, the, because a lot of people are talking about COVID, we're in isolation. And you had a good idea when we were talking last night that to keep the, the, the PowerPoint part quite short in the beginning so that we can actually interact with each other because we're all sitting in isolation, sitting in our houses, and it'd be nice to have a community conversation. So, you know, I love Good this one. <laughs> Who's driving our digital transformation? And, and it's COVID-19. And Equally, these stats are incredible. You know, literally three months ago, the Fortune 500 JSEs, you know, literally, you know, it was only a top, a top 10 priority for 60% of them. And now it's a top three priority for 95% of them. So the question I've got for people is what's your digital transformation strategy for yourself, for your business, and even for your investment space? And that's what tonight is, is really going to be about. I've spoken quite a lot over, over the last couple of months around the adoption curve of technology. Many of you have heard me talk about the adoption curve of cell phones. And really what happens in the beginning is it's, it's pleasure. It's people like me that loved cell phones in 1999 and went and got a cell phone because I liked it. But now people have a cell phone because they have to. It's about pain. And people move four times more away from pain than they do towards pleasure. So what, what COVID's doing is it's creating a digital transformation, whether people like it or not. The second thing I wanted to share with you was that in the last crash, which was literally 10 years ago in 2009, I'd, been, I'd helped 2,500 people buy houses. And yet what I learned was that the wealthiest people buy stable income producing assets, predictable income producing assets, things like medical buildings. And so one of the first lessons that, that I wanted to share with you is that in times like this, it's about income becomes so important. The next lesson I wanted to teach you was that this was a building in Wimbledon and I could buy this building for 160,000 pounds per unit when the cost price to replace it was 320,000. It was 50% below replacement cost. It was fully furnished and it had a 12% net yield. And it was an absolute no brainer. There was one little problem though. I needed 10 million pounds cash to execute on the deal quickly. And what I learned in the last crash is you need to have, you know, a war chest or a vulture fund or cash ready to really be able to execute. And those two ideas were really why we created Wealth Migrate. And, and what I really realized, and if you look at a lot of economic theory, these big opportunities, these big crashes come about four times in our life. In our investment career, they come three or four times in our life, which is every 10 years. And as Ray Dalio said, the most important thing to do now is to diversify across countries, currencies, and assets. And I'm going to share with you a link where you can literally go and he wrote a very good article called The Changing World Order. I'm not going to read it to you because you have the ability to read. So I'd, I'd really go and check out what Ray Dalio is talking about. The other person that's closer to home is a gentleman called uh, Do, uh, Professor Francis Ferulli, who, who basically teaches real estate at UCT and funny enough taught me 25 years ago. And he says that it used to be about location, location, location when it came to property. And now it's about technology, 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 and data, data, data. He went on to talk about STEEP, which stands for social trends, technology trends, economic trends, environmental trends, and political trends. And you know, tonight we're going to be getting into this because the world has changed. We all know that now, and it's how you actually take advantage of it. We've got an opportunity later that I'm going to share with you, which is our wealth diversification marketplace where in the past to do what Ray Dalio said, to diversify across assets, across countries, across currencies, was a hell of a difficult. Now you can do it all in one place, safely and simply. And then finally, before I hand over to Willem, I just wanted to share with you some of the things that, that we've spoken about in the past. I'm not gonna talk about them here because you can go and watch the recording. Just, just ask for the eight trends webinar and, and we can send it to you. But we talk about the six Ds of, of, of exponential disruption. And every single industry goes through these six Ds. 
The second thing that I've spoken about is intersecting long-term trends. I personally had the privilege of learning from Ray Kurzweil. And what you need to look at is I did a webinar on the eight technology trends that were intersecting with the eight societal trends. Now I did that before COVID and all that COVID has done is accelerate these trends. And, and really to give you a concluding thought with this is that they call it the Netscape moment. In 1995, there were 16 million people on the internet, but it was only the, the techie people that knew how to write code, et cetera. Netscape made it easy for all of us. And today there's 4 billion people that are on the internet. But someone who rode that trend, someone who rode that curb or that wave was Amazon. And it's now a trillion dollar company. You know, Jeff Bezos is the wealthiest person in the world. But if you'd invested $10,000 pre-IPO in Amazon, today it would be worth $12 million. What I'm gonna share with you later is the way for you to look at the way the world's changed. How you don't have to wait for a business to actually IPO to be able to get involved at its growth stage. As Willem said, you know, at that founder, that founder stage. I'm gonna share with you what's happening with Society 5.0 about how entrepreneurship is changing and also how your investment space is changing. It's now all about being a venture builder. I'm gonna share with you the number one way to reduce risk in these current times with regards to business. And finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about in impact investing. I know that Willem, you're gonna talk a lot about this as well, impact and purpose investing. And that really will bring us to the opportunity where people can consider where the world is going with Wealth 5.0, what the Global Wealth Group is doing with our meta marketplace. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you all the principles that Willem is gonna speak about tonight, how you can conceptualize them, but there's no point in the stuff being in theory if you don't actually take advantage. And so as I tend to joke with people, we've always, I've loved Amazon and the way Amazon has been created over the last 20 years. And there's great lessons that can be learned from Amazon, but why can't we have Amazon of real estate or even Amazon of personal wealth. And later, when, we, when I go to this part of the webinar, you'll get to decide whether you can afford not to be part of this. But with now, I really want to be able to pivot to Willem because this is about Willem. It's about technology. It's about the seven things that you need to know about the present and the future and, and where we're going. And so Willem, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to you because I'm fascinated by this conversation and how you have even evolved over the last three years uh, since the last time we did presentations. What has changed? Where is the world? What is the impact of COVID? You know, I'm, I'm fascinated about where you see the world going. Scott, thanks for that. <clears throat> you've stolen three of my slides. And so um, you've helped me truncate my presentation a bit tonight. <clears throat> I'm here by my folks place. I had to drive 40 kilometers to get here because uh, there was an unscheduled power outage at my house. <laughs> And there's a power outage coming here. So I hope ESCOM can stick to at least this schedule. And then I've got the uh, curfew to beat to get on my way home. So it's a, it's, a, it's a tightly lit night. Thanks for taking those three slides off me. You're going to help me get home safe without a fine. to Africa. <laughs> a quick segue, perhaps, just on the point that you had made about uh, the Amazon investment and venture building. It's interesting for me. And it's one of my learnings of the last five years. Um, it strikes me that when an individual that is infused shows up with a business plan and asks for money, which is typically what angel and venture slash early stage investment really is all about, um, it leaves investors with very low uh, certainty as to how to de-risk for, you know, the enthusiasm not showing up to be the reality one day. And uh, as I had said, it, it really is all about the founder uh, team, and it's a human capital game. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, because in a time of COVID, one of the things that's been coming to the fore is authenticity of people. Given all the financial pressure, the time pressure, the health scare pressure, the psychological pressure that as a society we face ourselves with, um, the authentic self is starting to come to the fore. And I think this is the perfect time, um, if you can get it right, to pick entrepreneurs that are going to make a success out of, out of this chaos time that we're in. And so I look at disruption, not as the consulting word that it's become, uh, which is quite colloquial, but rather is that a lens through which we can spot some opportunity, which is what I've tried to depict in the conversation that we're going to have today. 
Anyone that's heard me talk would have heard of the 16 exponential technologies, but now also a virus that's made itself into the matrix of disruptive forces. Now, interestingly, I'll talk about what this slide behind the bars uh, in jail uh, represent. But what, fascinatingly, by virtue of the education system being pre pre predominantly retrospective, um, this exponential world is forcing people to take a prospective view, and it's not something that we practiced in. And as a consequence, Extech Capital has been able, has found itself inadvertently talking to boards of lots of companies in South Africa, the US, UAE, uh, England, about exponential technology and how to think and adopt in a linear, uh, from away from a linear into an exponential mindset. And what I've found, <clears throat> and I'll challenge the audience tonight, is that there are typically a couple of personas that come to the fore in how you, you approach this conversation and how you are listening. The first is, and you can now imagine a board, imagine it for your own company, or perhaps where this is tackling your, your, your private, your family and you know, your private persona. There's the first persona, which is, uh, I'm a hostage. I don't want to really be here. Uh, I'm caught here and I'm told to be here and there's roll call. So I'm stuck. I'm a hostage, hence I'm behind bars. The next persona is that I'm gonna listen and enjoy this. It's a little bit of a holiday. It's a break from my ordinary course of what I do. I'm gonna meet some people. I'm gonna drink some margaritas and then I'm out of here. This one is interesting. This is a persona which we call the PhD. This is someone who cannot wait for the Q&A section to raise their hand to not only ask a question, but actually answer that question in asking it and then showcase for everyone else the knowledge base that they have uh, because they've read about this stuff. Um, good enthusiasm, a little bit disruptive sometimes. And then Scott, this one is the cheerleader. Very enthusiastic about the future, super amped to be on the team, no clue as to the strategy. And then there's this one. And I wonder if I can open my chat box here and ask people, what do you think this persona is? When someone shows up to this uncomfortable conversation about change, about technology, about where the world's going, uncertainty, rewriting of rules, this type of persona, it's about 20, 22% of every group shows up as well. Now, um, let me see if I can get my chat box open here because, um, yeah, here we go. But we got knitting is fun, DNA of success, critic, <laughs> okay, so I was waiting for someone to say a virus. Um, uh, engineer unpacking the info. Okay, so this is a, an antibody. It's the opposite of a virus. The purpose of an antibody is to float around silently, quietly inside of the body and then spot these agents of change and attack them silently and kill them, get rid of them. And more often than not, I've actually found myself inside of those conversations, specifically where from the previous education regime, we've gotten into a space of uh, harnessing value and seeking out efficiencies, and we bank on the underlying value chain remaining the same. And of course, when it changes, you find yourself with this physiological response set, psychological and physiological, that seems to fight against change. And just for yourself tonight, ladies and gents, ask yourself, which mindset am I in inside of this conversation? All of them have got pros and cons, but the self-awareness part is what's important for me. Be aware, uh, and if there are cons that you need to mitigate for the purpose of this conversation to be valuable, then I implore you to do so. Perspective is everything. We've all seen this picture, and depending on how you look at that middle picture, you see typically either a young lady on the left-hand side or uh, what looks to be uh, an elderly lady on the right-hand side. And your action sets are dictated by what your your perspective feeds you as the perception of reality. So perspective really does matter. And no, no, more, no, no more was it true than in a scenario like I'm going to pick for you here. What you're looking at is the same street in New York City in 13 years apart. It's Fifth Avenue, Manhattan. And on the left-hand side uh, is the 1900s and on the right-hand side is 1913. So 13 years separating these two pictures of the same street. The challenge on the left-hand side is, can you spot the first car in and amongst all of the horses? And there it is, in case you haven't found it. And the opposite challenge, or the inverse challenge on the right-hand side, which is, can you, for me, find the horse now in and amongst all of the cars that have become the standard? Take a quick look, and of course, there it is. And what you're looking at here um, has got significance. Let me illustrate. Imagine that you were a saddle maker. So you were used to the value chain of transport and logistics being conducted through the instrument of a horse. 
We gave these horses names. We gave them sugar lumps. We mourned them when they died. We loved them. We combed them. They had emotional bond to it. And we exchanged that over a period of 13 years into a box of metal that had controlled explosions that moved forward. And now ask yourself this. If you were the saddle maker, you're, you were predominantly preoccupied with building uh, product innovation, right? So saddles that could sport long distance, maybe carry a passenger, perhaps carry cargo, perhaps this lighter weight for the horse itself, a racing saddle, an endurance saddle. So you'd be doing product innovation and you'd think you're cutting edge because of your product innovation, not knowing that the combustion engine has now started to converge with petroleum industry, which has also started to converge with the assembly line. And each of those were individually observable. But what did we do to pivot our businesses and ready ourselves, both professionally and privately, to be able to get ready for this revolution that was occurring? And I have a question. So what do you think these saddle makers had as a reaction when they saw the first combustion engine, which was 1872? Do you think that they looked at that and said, we better pivot our business? My sense is probably not. Uh, when they saw the first assembly line, 1875, uh, or when the petroleum industry started to formalize in 1860, each of these things individually impacting the transport and logistics industry to some limited extent. But when they converge, of course, massive change in that there was a fundamental reform. Now, what were their reactions? Uh, you, and you saw it in the, in, the, in the computer industry as well. Uh, there's a maximum need for 640 kilobytes of memory. <laughs> um, only the rich will ever be able to afford this. No one other than big business will ever use a personal computer. Those are all quotes from the, from the technology revolution in personal computing. And the same kind of thing happened in the transport and logistics. And of course, as you can see from my metaphor, the same thing is busy happening right now. Uh, okay, so when it became apparent, because all these disparate, seemingly disparate technology advances didn't impact on saddles per se. So what happened when they saw the first car? What was their reaction then? Uh, naysaying? Um, shooting it down? Was there some antibody in there? Perhaps some cheerleading, not understanding where this thing was going? What do you think was their reaction to the millionth car when this thing was now proven and industry was starting to shift? And of course, the catch is your perspective of when you see these green shoots of change that is forthcoming, that potentially can impact industries at large. And then, interesting. So, uh, yes, we know that humans react like this, but why? Why is that? Because if we can understand the why, then perhaps we can do some self-management, both from a business and personal perspective in terms of readying ourselves. And I, my thesis is that there are two reasons why. It's the human condition and the education systems of the world. From a human condition, I hope you've seen this. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Over time, this talks about our responses when a trigger is somewhere in industry. So when you see the first car driving down Manhattan and you're a saddle maker, First, there's a potentially uh, a lag, which is over here, if you can see my mouse cursor, then ultimately a peak of inflated expectation, and then a trough of disillusionment. And then only over time do we enter into this phase of maturity thinking around what the possibilities, the opportunities, the threats are. Um, and then, of course, as this was my third slide that you stole. Thanks for that, Scott. But essentially, uh, companies that get this, this human condition, and, and, and capitalize on it, I figured the following out. In any group of people, there is a normal distribution. And if we cut the segments of this distribution as follows, you've got the pioneers, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and then the laggards. And the scale seems to sit in the early majority and in the late majority because of volume. But the trick is that if you attack them first, you're unlikely to mobilize the pioneers and the early adopters. So what you want is that 15% threshold of critical mass, subsequent to which the early adopters will move because someone else has already moved. The late majority will start to do so because they're running out of options, and these guys have no options. The 16% laggards is you trying to fix your Nokia 6110. You can't. You can't find parts for it anymore, and you have to migrate to a smartphone now. I'm sitting in my parents' house, so I don't say that too loudly. <laughs> but, um, so what you want to do as an, as, as an organization that's trying to tap into this market space is you want to convince the pioneers and the early adopters, the, the aggregate 15%, which 16%, uh, which puts you over the first 15% hurdle. And effectively, that's the kind of conversation that we're having tonight. 
From an education perspective, there's two ways of thinking about this, retrospective and prospective. And even the zenith of academic excellence in the world, the Harvards, MITs, Yales, Princetons of the world, follow case-based methodology, where they take a set of circumstances that have already occurred in the past, distill from it the lessons that are garnerable and teach those to participants that pay $100,000 a year for this. The problem with it is that it's, it's, I mean, it's great training, and it's a wonderful insight, but it's still retrospective. It does not teach people how to make maps as opposed to efficiently follow maps. You're making a new industry, not finding the value chain efficiencies inside of an existing industry. And this is why the founder team is so absolutely important because if they are not at heart pioneers and adventurers with a persistence made of titanium, don't invest. Let someone else take those startup risks and bank on them in a private equity or institutional space once they've matured. Expect lower returns then because the majority of the exponential growth kickoff has been taken out of the candle. But if you are able to distill for that risk, this is the kind of team that you want to back. Uh, one that has uh, uh, not been uh, succumbed by the inf education system of yesteryear that is predominantly retrospective. Uh, Scott, this is the difference between getting uh, a roadmap and say, follow it and try to conserve fuel or the, the converse, which is here is a panga. It's not a skill that you have. Carve a road. Later on, someone will come and tar it. And then people will come and follow it with efficiency on the fuel tank. If you've ever heard me talk, you would have heard of the 16 exponential technologies. Just by the way, can I do this? I, I, I ask people um, to do a self-test in this space. And that is to say, if these technologies, when they converge, together with the steroid juice that the coronavirus has now given us and making all of this go faster, and industries are going to change, which means our livelihoods, how we operate, what we do for work, and therefore then ultimately also our personal lives, don't you think we should name them? Like, should we not have them at our fingertips? We could even have to deal with them. So can I ask, I'll give you 20 seconds. Sit there for yourself, ladies and gents, and think. Which of these technologies can I list? Everyone can list AI. I'll give you one for free, AI. <laughs> Just because the consultants have done it so much damage that they're quoted in the hallways of every corporate in South Africa. So everyone can name AI. Can you name 15 more? And then I'll share with you that on average, boards of JSE listed, uh, some Fortune 500s that I've been fortunate enough to work with, on average, five to seven. In one exceptional circumstance, in a value-based retailer uh, in Kailsrefir, there was a finance guy who could name 12 of the 16. <laughs> but in the main, we score pretty low when we, when we get these 16. And then the follow-on question, of course, is if we can't name the 16, how are we developing strategies and tactics in our own businesses and personal lives to deal with them? And then more so, how do we expect our teams to safeguard our organizations if we can't even lead them just on what the content is, never mind an understanding beyond the superficial naming of them. So there's a personal challenge. If you scored low, this is something to look at. Um, for those that did score low, um, here they are. The, from the top left, I'll quickly just run through them. I'm not talking technology per se tonight. I want to talk more convergence. But top left is nanotech, then quantum computing. This is huge. For security in the world, quantum computing is, is like, it's not even like a car to a horse. It's like a rocket to a horse. AI, which everyone knows, and the one next to it, machine learning. Extended reality, which has now gone beyond virtual reality. Got one lacquer example of that today. Robotics, digitized biology. Space, one of my absolute favorites for obvious reasons, and uh, some examples tonight of where that's going. Drones, energy, blockchain, cryptography slash cryptocurrencies. Uh, old love of mine. Uh, Internet of Things, 3D printing, and crowd. Both crowdsourcing as well as crowdfunding. If you add all of those together, there's 15 of them. Individually, very interesting, very novel, very sexy to talk about, but the opportunity sits here. It's when they start to converge and they rewrite these rules of things like logistics industry, of data, of space, of connectivity, and manufacturing. This thing, garden variety snail. It moves at 0 0.047 kilometers an hour. This was the best athlete that I think humanity has ever seen. 100 meters Berlin. Uh, 9,58. Uh, here's our guy from Tuane Boys High, <laughs> who is now launching rockets uh, weekly. 
uh, and when it breaks the gravitational pull of the Earth, it's doing 25,000 kilometers an hour. Here's a graph that shows you how impactful compound interest or exponential acceleration is. And when that snail has got its first iteration, it's moving at the stated speed. Um, after nine iterations, it's doing faster than what Usain did that 100 meters in. After 19 iterations, it's keeping up with the rocket. And after 30 iterations, it doesn't even make sense because you tell me, what does 50 million kilometers an hour look like? I mean, we've all seen that schmuck in his X5 on the highway overtaking you at 200 kilometers an hour. So we know what 200 Ks an hour looks like. We've been in a plane, we can maybe think what a thousand Ks an hour look like, but what does 50 million, it becomes inconceivable. And so we tune out and we revert back to our physiological linear way of thinking about the world. In easy terms, if I said to you take 30 exponential steps, you would go around this planet 27 times. And the converse of that is a 30 linear steps, which would get you from here to the parking lot. Linear is easy. I know where I am, I know where the end is, I know where halfway is, and I know where my competitors are, and therefore I can gauge my probability of success. On exponential, it becomes a weird mathematical thing to try and figure out where am I relative to my competition. For instance, halfway is on the second last iteration. And if you've heard me talk before, you would have seen that. Now, even though this exponential world is so weird to our physiology and our way of coding and very contra the education system of the world, there are some frameworks that are starting to emerge, of which I'm going to allude to today. This is the other slide that Scott stole about the six Ds. And in fact, to his fairness, he didn't steal it. We both stole it because this comes out of the valley and we didn't think of this, but this is a nice framework that's been touted around the world. And it talks about these six Ds. So firstly, that uh, information enablement occurs inside of an industry, subsequent to which that digitization undergoes a deceptive growth phase. This is my snail when it goes from the garden doubling one, two, it's boring, three, very boring, four, now it's very boring and I tune out, I've got other things to do. But as you saw, by iteration nine or 10, it's becoming quite disruptive in that it's overtaking Usain Bolt. And then these last three steps happen very quickly. It demonetizes, so it becomes a unit cost that is extremely low and individually identifiable. The age-old example, I don't buy my CD with a batch of 16 CDs that have been pre-bundled for me. If you are a company like MultiChoice, this is what you're struggling with at the moment because you've pre-bundled sport and everything else is across subsidizing bouquet. And consumers don't necessarily want that. They want mass customization and they want demonetized services. So I want to pay for what I watch, not for things that I don't watch. It dematerializes, so it becomes digital, and then of course democratizes. Because it's digital, it can go to the entire globe. And therefore your market is not Bryanston or uh, Stellenbosch, your market is planet Earth. And if we get right what all Tswane boys, Haya, Alma Mater, Elon Musk thinks that he's going to get right, it will be other planets as well. And so your thinking takes on a fundamentally different shape and size. And that, if I could, so let me just say, Scott, for me, that was one of the biggest things to change was my mindset around thinking local versus forcing every thought into a global perspective. Well, I mean, yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, I actually found something out today that I was quite excited about. And uh, I asked the team to check how many countries our members come from now. And um, there's 192 countries in this world. How many uh, different countries do you think the members on our platform come from? Take a guess. So I am an ex-accountant. I will just help you there with one thing. You can get 198 different passports, but there are 205 sovereign states. So That's even the world around how many countries we have is, con is confusing. Many, how many do we have? Okay, so how many do you think we got on the, how many different countries do you think we got on the platform? Uh, I would say, I, I would say 55. 152. You're spreading like the coronavirus, Scott. <laughs> it's exciting, though. When you think about it, we've only actually paid, done paid for marketing in South Africa and China. That means 150 other countries found us through, through online. Now, the only reason I brought that up is that, you know, when you take the real estate space and whatever, it's, we're so much in the digitized. We're not even in the deceptive phase yet where no one takes the money raised online seriously yet. I mean, it's, it's irrelevant to the big picture. But when you, but you see that distribution, like you said, the coronavirus, it's really fascinating to me. So anyway, I'll stop interrupting, but I just thought that was brilliant. Too. Well, it's a wonderful segue because later on, I'm going to talk about purpose-driven com companies. And, the, and as I said to you, when we met, the very first thing that attracted me to Wealth Migrate was the fact that your purpose is not a Joburg or a emerging market only uh, purpose. 
closing the, the wealth gap and allowing for people to, to take investment space into, into opportunities that they would never before have had is a global uh, need. And so it's actually no wonder that you're already in 75% of the countries on the planet because this is a human need that Wealth Migrate is trying to fulfill and not a localized or a specific industry need. And that's where the scalability behind this sits if your founder team has got persistence. And I think the people that know you will talk about that persistence maybe in the Q&A a little bit because um, yeah, I don't want to put too much honey around your mouth, but uh, I, let me get to that part when I get to that part. From a deceptive perspective, uh, you touched on it now, Scott. I would just say this. Um, I use the example of 3D printing, uh, and that's because many people for the last sort of four or five years have believed that 3D printing is a new thing, maybe six, seven years old. It's 42 years old this year. That, yeah, have a look at the first 3D printer over there, which melted a blob in a week. And then, of course, as time progressed and the snail picked up pace, got better and better at it, where today we've got some applications that are commercially viable and being rolled out. The first of which is um, these invisible braces to correct teeth that have totally uh, given orthodontists either an opportunity or a headache. And the second is this, what you're looking at is a picture in Mexico of a community where a new story and an NGO partnered to put together a village of 50 homes, which is the equivalent of RDP. And now for a second pause and consider the slum pictures that you've seen online or in person in the likes of India, in the likes of South America, in the likes of even South Africa, and what that slum slash RDP initiative set had looked like, and the cost associated with it to the taxpayer and the psychological cost of people not having homes. And then you compare that to something like this, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a sec. And then of course, it's now also gone into um, disrupting healthcare, in that we've now got preventative and regenerative healthcare happening with the help of 3D printing, and not only a skeletal structure, but also organs and attachments. The same kind of thing is happening to uh, decluttering screens. And I think what you're looking at here, you'll notice Google Glass um, there as a evolution of virtual or extended reality. Um, it has 100% as a purpose to get rid of screens on devices. Every person looking at this webinar right now is looking at it through a device that has a screen attached to it. And the ultimate goal globally is to have people wear specs or contact lenses that can superimpose imagery to get rid of these devices. Uh, and imagine what that would do for reinstating family dinner time where you walk into a restaurant when you could still walk into restaurants and look at people sitting by the same table, but all of them, I mean, this is what you see. You see the back of a phone. Um, and so hopefully there's some social good that is, that's driven from these types of technologies as well. Now, still in the end of the, of the deceptive phase, but starting to make those disruptive impacts. For example, let's make a tangible example out of this. If you're the orthodontist, uh, your revenue is to sell braces. So any kid that walks into your waiting room that's got a half a skewed tooth gets braces today. Mom has got to pay for it. Scott, you're a father. I don't know if John T's got braces, but does he? No? Okay, has he got mates that have got braces? Not yet. He's a bit young. He's eight, but, but I know it's coming. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And then, of course, you've got to get your budget ready, ready for when it's coming because it's quite expensive. Um, the cost, if you think about the business for the orthodontist, is, has got to do with paying off old study debt, the seven years to get through medical school plus the specialization. Then you have to maintain your professional standards through CPD courses. You've got to take out insurance. You've got to buy equipment. You've got to get premises. You've got to employ some people. And let's assume that you make a good profit margin like a good business does, which is 25% PAT, so profit after tax. If you're selling these braces, which like they do in the US, go for about $8,000, then your profit after tax is about $2,000. These 3D printed ones use a camera to scan your mouth, take six minutes, gets uploaded to a server somewhere in Mountain View. A couple of orthodontists, four or five of them sit and look at this, make a plan which is learning, uh, which is inducing machine learning in the background, so soon they won't be needed. I log into a portal, I, I, I sign off that I'm happy with how my teeth are gonna end as an end product. And then they email me the 3D uh, plans for printing my own braces. All I've gotta do is find a high fidelity printer, plug the email in and print my braces. Over a period of 26 weeks, I get these braces and they cost $8.29 each. So if you multiply 8.29 by 26, you get $215. Now, if you're the orthodontist, or the saddle maker, 
or anyone hanging on to the snail perspective, you see your problem. <laughs> How do you compete when someone's revenue is lower than your profit margin? That's hard. And of course, then the other thinking is that this set of um, orthodonti, what's the plural for orthodontists? The orthodonti. Uh, they're not focused on cornering a certain segment of the market in a geographical area. They're interested in this blue ball here in the bottom. And that's what they view as their market. 3D printing, uh, just from a disruptive perspective, think about this. These houses, these RDP houses, they actually look quite funky to me. There's my German shepherd just saying hello to my folks in the background. Um, uh, these houses were printed in 24 hours each, and they cost $3,400 to make. And that's before we've unlocked full scale efficiencies because we've only printed 50 here. So if you think about this, and this is a thing for wealth migrate to think about, right? This is a very robust debate to have. If the residential property market in the world price point is driven primarily through supply and demand curves, and supply takes nine months and is millions of rands in cost to build, then this thing fundamentally changes the supply chain, which in turn fundamentally changes the price point, which in turn impacts 65% of the world's retirement preservation. So this is the thing to think about. This is the first car on the road while we're all making saddles. And this is the thing to think about. Uh, at the same time, I mentioned convergence. Now I've got self-driving cars and electric cars coming into play, which means that my commute to work means nothing. That's even if I do still go to work, given my connectivity that I've got, but my commute has got a lot less to do with my active involvement, which means that I probably relax in the car or sleep or make calls or do work or not to push the lewdness of this conversation's perimeter, but like a very well-known German brand car that have employed artists and designers to think about the inside of the car from the perspective of the likelihood that people are very likely to have sex in cars, given that they don't have to drive them. And so where do we put the handles and the footholds given this change in application and nature? And in there, why do I need to then live downtown? Can I not live rather by the waterfalls far out from town, again, impacting supply and demand curves associated with the one vehicle that's preserving wealth all over the world? <sighs> okay, Scott, um, I'm nearing my end here, but just uh, one other thing that I wanted to caution again when we're looking at these technologies, specifically picked AI for this because it's become such a colloquial thing. You can't spend 30 minutes in a financial services environment without someone saying a sentence with the word AI in it. It's ill understood, and I blame the consultants for that. Um, right now, there's no sentient being. There is only advanced automation, which takes learning from how humans do things and then does it right 24 seven and faster. But that's advanced automation. The decision as to which uh, automated protocol to invoke is driven through machine learning and that's getting better. But right now there's no sentient AI. And um, AI itself is made up of about 36 other components. So everyone, please do me a favor. Let's do ourselves a favor. When next some oak smooth talking guy walks in and starts talking about AI, pause him or her and ask which AI? because there's four main streams. And if they don't know that, then they actually shouldn't be preaching to you in the first place. An interesting thing that's come out of the AI automation space where machines learn from humans is this um, study, which was done by a prominent university in Massachusetts. And essentially they let a machine scan the sentiment of our social and news feeds. So this machine got a feel for how we look at the world. And then it was put in an impossible experiment which was, it was in control of a vehicle of sorts. And this vehicle was gonna have to go left or right and crash. And when it crashes, someone dies because there's someone in front of the car on either side. And then the question is, well, who do you let die? And if you think about it, the insurance industry and the car manufacturers are struggling with this because if there's a Tesla and there's someone that runs um, you know, in front of this car on the road and the car mathematically can't break or escape the scenario. And now there's a choice as to who's going to perish, how the hell do you make that choice? Because the consequences of that is probably a lawsuit that looks at pinning responsibility for this because a life has been lost. So do you sue the guy that coded the algorithm? Do you sue the guy that made the sensor that picked up the data that was put into the algorithm? The guy that put the brand on it? Uh, the guy that owns the car? The guy that made the car? Like who? How is this going to work? So these are important questions. But now check the bias. Because we're automating and we're fast forwarding these steroids of technology, um, some interesting things came out. So these were the 
characters that were given to the machine inside of this experiment. And now it had to choose who to live and who to die and then make a ranking order. And here are the results. And blue is a propensity to keep alive. And red is a propensity to let die. And um, check here. Yeah. Check at the assumptions. It just, I'm just going to scrape the surface here. Just check at the assumptions that have been brought into this that we haven't even considered. Keep a person with a pram alive first. Okay, why? Because it's maybe two lives? Well, that assumes that the pram isn't empty or filled with groceries or filled with a young baby that uh, doesn't have a life a long lifespan or a baby that will become a criminal. So you see where like all the assumptions that we haven't even touched on, but somehow we've ended up with this judgment call. And then we keep a girl alive before we keep a boy alive. And that to me makes sense given where the world is currently given the uh, gender-based violence awareness and the, um, you know, the freedom fighting and rights uh, fighting that has been happening all over the world. I'm not judging, I'm, I'm observing. And then very interesting as you go down to the bottom here, uh, which as a dog lover, and you heard just my German separate three minutes ago, I love because we keep a dog alive before we keep a criminal alive. And then I feel very sorry for the cat people because, sorry, the machine thinks that from our social feeds and our news feeds, the sentiment of the planet is that you kill a cat first. Maybe it's because it's got nine lives. I don't know. All right. So then over and above all these technologies that are now starting to come together, tackling our retirement, tackling uh, wealth preservation, uh, tackling how we conduct business, how long we live, flip man, everything about life. Over and above all of that, we've got, got the steroids behind it, which is this coronavirus, which really is a time multiplier force in my view. So you've got the exponential snail picking up pace, supercharged with this uh, corona pandemic, uh, which is just really blindsided the world in terms of readiness and, and impact. And effectively, if you think about this, this curve that we go through, uh, check South Africa and just check the sentiment. Initially, the peak of inflated expectations. Finally, we have a leader and this leader is ballsy enough to call a lockdown and tell Oaks that we're going to do this together. And then uh, <laughs> two months after that, he's in court defending his position that he was just hailed as a hero for. And finally, the leader is there. And then, of course, maturity perhaps not yet, but hopefully soon starts to ensue as to our thinking about how to deal with this. And can I point out a controversial point here? Do you remember the flack that Boris took when he said, yeah, we should just go for herd mentality. And he was crucified in the press for his political incorrectness of tacitly saying that people will have to die for the community as a whole to survive and accrue herd mentality, uh, herd immunity rather. Uh, and of course, now you see some of the latest thinking is that maybe if a vaccine, uh, meantime until market readiness takes too long and our antibody fade away is too high a frequency, then the only way to beat this thing is with herd mentality. But I'm not sure if we're ready to have that conversation globally as a society just yet. And again, I'm not judging and I'm not advocating, I'm saying observe. And of course, what's happening now is each of these technologies and the convergent pieces and this bloody virus are starting to converge. And these reaction sets that we have on are truncated and compressed. And it's no wonder that we feel like we're in chaos and alone and um, dazed with the fact that schools are open, then they're closed, then they're open again. And our education system don't serve our kids anyway. And what will they do for their future? And we live longer and I can't travel and I can't get my money out. Whoa. It's rough. We're in a rough place globally. If you stole this slide, COVID is supercharging digital transformation all over the world. You find hyper-customization as one aspect of this multitude of things starting to change. The age old example that I have of Starbucks, they only sell eight types of coffee, but they sell them in 88,000 different permutations with all you can see there at the bottom, the characteristics that you can attribute. And they engender you emotionally to it by writing your name on it. So consumers want mass customization. They want what they want. And now, of course, as you said, digitization for the enterprise, so move away from the consumer for a second, was a top 10 priority for maybe 60% of the JSE. Now it's top three, all of them. 50% of consumers, primarily by virtue of lockdown, have had to buy stuff inside of shops, uh, sorry, inside of online, as opposed to shops because of lockdown. I don't think that'll stay the same necessarily, but it's broken the ice into getting people to buy online. 
that haven't perhaps digitally participated before. And then most consumers are saying they don't want to go back to the shop because it's dangerous, risk infection. Uh, internet proliferation is rife in South Africa specifically as well. I know we've got people from all over the world. This trend is in varying stages of evolution all over the planet. The share of, this is interesting, the share of how internet is consumed has started to shift and it's now become predominantly mobile. It's not a fixed access point like a desktop or a laptop on a desk per se anymore. It's now these small little devices that we carry around. And then of course the proliferation of smartphones is deceptive. In South Africa, it's about 40% now. Value retailers will tell you that they're selling 80% upwards of all their cell phones that they sell are smartphones. And remember that South Africa has got a very young population and a disproportionate young segment, which is young, um, which means that the economically active people are all smartphone enabled now. The cost per gigabyte is starting to plummet for these mobile devices. There's the rain disruptor, but the slide is all already because uh, I think it's now three weeks ago, MTN announced a 30 Rand per gigabyte. So they're even coming in lower than rain. And then one of my favorite things, if you look up at the night sky, I've taken three pictures here. And I just wonder, Scott, I don't know if you recognize this. I, I haven't tested this with you per se, but for, for the benefit of everyone, what are you teasing out of these three pictures? What do you see that's glaring at you? Satellites. Okay, yeah, he's a clever guy. Most people will say, look, those stars are in a straight line. Yeah, they're in a straight line because there are satellites. This is Starlink. This is the shop that Elon Musk is building. And every time NASA sends uh, supplies to the space station, he hitches a ride for his internet provision satellites, which he's spinning all around the world. And that's what it's supposed to look like. It must circumnavigate the planet, enmesh it really. And the idea is to be able to provide 5G or faster level internet to every square inch of the surface of the planet. And ultimately you can do that at the, color of a dos, uh, the, the cost of a dollar per person per month, which means this guy is building an $8 billion a month turnover business. Um, the last launch there you can see was the 13th of June and he's now got, I think it is 500 and something. There were 540 satellites in orbit already. The service is launched in North America and Canada and within the next 12 months, it'll also be in Africa and South Africa. And so that consumer is digitizing and is digitizing with infrastructure that doesn't even come from here. By the way, if you're interested, click that link, uh, findstarlink.com. And uh, if you have a telescope or binoculars, that thing will tell you when the Starlink train that is currently up there, or one of the trains, is over the area where you live. Uh, findstarlink.com. Ladies and gents, just have a look, because this is going to change the planet. This is going to connect every human being to the internet. Can you imagine the brain power that's going to be thinking of how to solve problems with us? Can you imagine the commerce increase if 5 billion people out of 8 billion people are online and we add another three? Can you imagine the knowledge flow that's going to occur? This is what this guy is facilitating. Please have a look tonight or tomorrow night if it's over your area and just feel the future. It's surreal. At the same time as this consumer is digitizing through infrastructure, other companies have started to say, well, if they're not coming back to the shop, we better do something about this. What you're looking at is Amazon Body Labs. They're handing out $50 gift cards to get people to get into these small little kiosks that they've popped up all over the show and they 3D scan your body. Why? So that I can sell you clothes that fit, not just shoes that fit, clothes that fit. So I'm assuming I'll go four times a year to have my summer and my winter body mapped so that I've got clothing that's compatible to both my summer and winter body. But they're gonna, they're gonna save the 3D print or the, the 3D architecture of Willem. And when they provide me with clothing, it won't be a large or an extra large, it'll be something that I can buy risk-free because it'll fit. So, stop, zoom out. You have enterprise ditching on the, uh, digitizing on the one hand. You have to because the consumers aren't coming to shops anymore. You've got the consumer digitizing because of digitizing of consumers as this cross pollination, plus infrastructure like the Elon stuff, plus infrastructure and services like the Amazon stuff. And all of a sudden you've got this clutter. So you've got 45 seconds of attention span, a small little screen, and now somehow I've got to get the right product in front of the right person at the right time, through the right channel, on the right device, and in the right format. There's no 
human marketing team that's going to do this. You could have three people look at the Facebook posts that you boost, which is, all, by the way, also an old thing. Because over and above these multitude of channels that exist, as an example, Facebook has got, I think it's 12 underlying channels. So it's Facebook, audiences, carousel, network, marketplace. They've all got their own pricing structures. For instance, if a user in the digital world types discovery, you tell me, are they looking for a Land Rover or are they looking for a medical aid? And if the network believes that they're looking for a Land Rover, you can pay as much as you want. You won't get your ad in front of that person because the relevance score goes down and consumers that experience irrelevance in their digital channels abandon those channels. So it's got to be the right ad for the right person at the time that he has a propensity to buy in the right format. And that's not something that humans get right if you've got millions of ads and millions of consumers and you've got a high volume of this which is why we've employed machine learning and AI to be able to do this. And we're actually partnering with Wealth Migrate as an enterprise to bring this to life, which we may talk about a little bit in the, in the Q&A session. Scott, just hold me honest for time, because um, I want to close out here. So a uh, couple of the things that I'm seeing, purpose is becoming very pronounced. Bringing more value to consumers and not just raking them from the margin is becoming pronounced. You have to digitize. Sorry, Willem, just talk a little bit about purpose and what the Fortune 500 CEOs assigned last year. So, great. I'll forward to that. Um, here, 181 of the top 200 CEOs in the world, August last year, got together. This is Bezos, um, Musk, Cook. These are not small guys. And they've signed a charter that essentially looks to rework the definition of a company inside of the American equivalent of the Companies Act. And what they wanna do is to differentiate between companies that are purpose-driven and those that are profit-driven. And the thinking is that in the medium term, call it five years, you'll find that you're unable to invest institutional or public money into companies that are solely profit-driven. And when they talk purpose, they're not saying purpose, the nice uh, uh, marketing agency lingo that you've been given to put under your brand. The, the catch line, and that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about purposes like this. Here's Tesla. People think that Tesla is a car company. They make cars, that's true. But if you ask people who work there, what's the purpose of Tesla? It's that they aim to transition the world from the use of fossil fuels into alternative and clean energy. And they happen to do it through cars that are electric. That purpose draws not mercenaries, it draws missionaries. It talks to my concept of team. If you've got a whole bunch of founders that are just in there for the profit, don't back them. Uh, that is a much later stage type of investment. If you've got mission and purpose driven people where that purpose is a global purpose, then you've got firstly, people that won't give up and, and they will persevere. And secondly, your market is global, which means that the scalability of this enterprise is so much more promising than someone who's hoping to be the best dentist in Rosebank. You catch my drift. That's why purposes become so important and specifically purposes that are community impact. I'm not talking about charity because charity is a flawed business model. If there isn't profit, charity can't exist. Charity needs to be funded. So charity in itself is not a business model, which is why purpose is not a charity. Purpose has to be profitable purpose, but there could be community impact with it. I'll give you one example. I'm getting a warning here just that we might face the power cut soon. So I want to wrap up with this, Scott, and say, just consider the difference between a linear and a transformative perspective on purpose. Let's take a watch company. If you have a linear view of your purpose, then it could be we help people to be on time. Now, you can think of the products, the recruitment, uh, the customer service that sits inside of that perspective and mind frame versus if you are transformative, we help people to achieve balance in their lives. Can you see how that opens up the scope for types of people that you recruit, the skill set that you garner inside of this organization, the products and services that you deliver within this organization, and therefore ultimately the revenue and the profit associated with it. The one will be lucky to hit double digit growth. The other needs to really mess it up not to do 10x. And that fundamentally is the difference in how to look at these opportunity sets, not only from my own life as to how exponential technology and the virus touches us, but specifically also in how we conduct investment strategy and thinking about opportunity sets. Oh, brilliant. 
So, Willem, just from your perspective, I um, I mean, I know that you could go all night. I think you said to me you got 900 slides um, to be able to share with, with people. And um, I'm conscious also of the fact that on or about 8 o'clock, your power's uh, going to go out. But as you said, you've got your iPad. What, what I'd appreciate, if you don't mind, is, is we pivot in and, and uh, based on, you know, we've been, we've been working with you on this as well, but based on where we're going and, and some of the exciting ideas. And then if we, we come back and actually run through a Q&A session and, and if there's relevant stuff, we can, if, if we can share slides or not, great. Uh, but if you don't mind, I'm just going to pivot uh, quickly to share pe with people what they've heard now, but actually how to put it into practical reality. So I just want to make sure that I haven't lost my connection. No, I haven't. So I think what's really important, and so firstly, thanks, Willem. You know, I think uh, it's, it's so fascinating seeing it and what's changing in the world and, and everything else. And, and bringing it all together, you know, I highly recommend that people go and look up the Society 5.0. I was first made aware of it by Roger Hamilton. It came from the Japanese. And it's really, really interesting in terms of where the world is going. You know, when, when one looks at it, we've gone from hunter-gatherer to agrarian, to industrial, to information. And now we're in this Society 5.0, IoT, big data, AI, you know, solutions for a better human life. In simple terms, you know, digital transformation and our creativity are coming together to solve problems and ultimately create value. And when you look at the SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals, which were set by the UN, there's 17 of them. So, you know, Willem, you talk about problems. The number one problem is no poverty. <clears throat> and when you think about those satellites going all over the world and the fact that half the world's planet is not even connected to the internet, let alone part of the global economic system. Um, this is going to change in our lifetimes and, and truly something that is, that is really exciting. You know, problem solving and value creation, diversity, decentralization, resilience, and sustainability and environmental harmony are, are where we're going. And so what does that mean for an entrepreneur who's 5.0? Well, it's about the digital layer. It's about being a practitioner. It's about being high touch, being, you know, dealing with lots of people, but yet having close human contact. It's about being an integrator. It's about being a zebra. And I'm going to explain that a bit more. It's about being centered, purpose centered. You spoke about missionaries versus mercenaries. It, it's at your core. It's who you are. And ultimately it's about being a venture builder. And this is, this again, I learned from, from Roger Hamilton and, it's really interesting because you talk about profit and purpose. A, a unicorn, and, and by the way, I've always wanted Wild Migrate to be a unicorn, which is a billion dollar company. But where the world is going is zebras, which are sustainable prosperity, community, quality, collaboration, and user success. It doesn't mean that you can't be a billion dollar company, but it's a different way of doing it. And what, what it says down the bottom here is believe that developing alternative business models to the startup status quo has become a central moral challenge of our time. These alternative models will balance profit and purpose, champion democracy, and put premium of sharing power and resources. Companies that create more than just, create a more just and responsible society will hear, help, and heal the customers and the communities that they serve. And then finally, you've got the investor 5.0. So in the, you know, in investor 4.0, it was all around venture capital. Someone like Wealth Migrate would go out and build a model, we'd try to go find a VC, we'd try to talk to Willem or, or, or Investec or someone and they would come and, and fund us. But now an investor 5.0, the growth is not determined by the founder necessarily anymore, but by the, the community in general and, and ultimately the community self-funding so that you're getting venture builder. You're going out and you, it's all about strategic partnerships. It's all about mergings. It's about strategic acquisitions. Because what that ultimately allows you to do is to build ecosystems where you're not trying to do everything in terms of organic growth, but you're actually building on top of each other. And that, that is built not only by the founder, but also by the funding. When we talk about impact investing and, and the rise of crowdfunding and how people are participating in businesses, this community probably doesn't need to talk about it too much, but we raised $2.5 million 18 months ago from 863 people in 43 countries without talking face to face to a single person. And that's what Wealth 5.0 is all about. It's about the impact you're having. It's about the creativity. It's about the high touch, the high tech and the whole digital framework and ultimately solving people's problems. You know, no matter how much technology changes, people have human needs that need to be solved. And that is really at the core of, of what Willem and I have been talking about tonight. So I mentioned to you Amazon, but I didn't tell you the whole story. Because what's really interesting with Amazon is that actually 
during the dot-com boom bust, the share price went from $76 to $6. And during that time, it stayed down for literally six to seven years. But what's fascinating is that people that invested at that point, $10,000 is actually today worth $152 million. So chaos can also represent great opportunities. What did they do? Well, they went out and they created their business and made it a platform business. They, they went out and they, they basically raised convertible debt. They went to the market and while all their competitors were, were literally going out of business, going bankrupt, Amazon innovated and they grew. And they did it through strategic partnerships. They did it through mergers and acquisitions. They did it through innovation. They, they, lent, they, they borrowed at 6.9% and they had very flexible conversion rates. And what's so interesting is that with their conversion to being a platform business, they not only supported their own businesses, but they supported other businesses and they became their biggest customer. So what we are really excited about is where we're going. We've always said, and, and I can remember back the first time I met Willem and, and he witnessed what a community crowdfunding platform was, we, we've always known that we were going to have the lower end of the market, the naught dollars to a thousand dollars. And we call that wealth create. We have not launched that yet. We had wealth migrate that there was the mid market, the thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars. And we are about to launch private wealth, which will be the hundred thousand dollars plus. But we started in the mid segment. And when you look at it, I've already given you the stats. We've got members now in 152 countries. We've done over $600 million in, in deal value. We've had you know, many different awards and, and over 70% reinvestment. But really the story behind the story here is that to do this, to build this marketplace, we had to build a platform. And this platform now allows us to partner and have multiple distribution streams on the demand side. It also allows us to have multiple distribution streams uh, or, or coming on the supply side. And it allows us to bring multiple different brands. So that platform that sits at our core, we call that wealth, not wealth migrate, but wealth. And as an example, we're in negotiations with Investec at the moment to give them an entire platform for their upward coming emerging investors. And it would be powered by wealth, which I'm sure you can see as a play on words. As Willem's already shown you, it's now all about hyper-focus. What, what he does with one of his companies that he's invested in is that it's all about this, this machine learning and this artificial intelligence. But, but you can't nowadays have a website or a marketplace like Amazon. It's too big, it's too broad, and it's trying to focus on too many people. You need to have hyper-focus. And if you have that hyper-focus, your cost per unit comes down and your return on spend goes up. So what does that mean? Well, ultimately it means a meta marketplace. We call it the global wealth group. There's four different parts to the global wealth group. You've got real estate in the top left corner. You've got diversified products in the top right corner. You've got genres in the bottom left corner and you've got communities in the bottom right corner. At your core, you've got your platform. And ultimately then you've got global marketplaces and then you've got local marketplaces. What's interesting is that with our platform, we launched Wealth Migrate, and that's got the global compliance and the global wallets. We then allowed Genius U, which was a private equity investment, to use the platform. We got uh, Zusa, and I always get the name wrong, but it's a UK real estate investment platform. We got the Enterprise Development Property Fund, which I don't know, Willem, if you even know about, but it's, it's all about uh, up and coming, inspiring um, black economically empowered um, investors to be able to participate. These are all live. We are currently looking at getting Sapin live. We've already got the wealth diversification marketplace live. We've got Cashbox live. We're in the next quarter bringing out private wealth. We're wanting to bring out Calio. We're wanting to bring out Investec. And then with time, when we find the right partners, we expect to have teams that are focusing just on millennials. We expect to have women or ladies just focusing. I think this is one of the biggest opportunities. Hilda and I have been talking about it for five years. Just the genre of empowering women, speaking to women, women speaking to women, their needs and, and their, their, I don't know, Willem, what your thoughts are around the whole woman, woman space, but it's, it's exponential, the opportunity there. And it's untapped. Well, Scott, for me, it fits into the broader concept of hyper customization. Um, there are pockets of homogenous groups all over the world and anyone pushing product or service that doesn't take cognizance of that is expecting the consumer to compromise. 
as the world gets digitized, that compromising need starts to diminish because someone will fill that need. Consumers are in control. Exactly. And I think what's so interesting is you can have Sharia compliant. And then our two community drives are the Wealth University and Wealth Movement. With time, we'll launch Wealth Create. And we can even launch localized solutions. We've always planned to have localized. Wealth America, Wealth South Africa, Wealth Europe, Wealth China. You name the country. Wealth Japan, Wealth Nigeria. It can all take place. And that allows what, what Willem's talking about with that hyper-focus. But it's all around the center core. And to give you an example, if you build a website today, you don't need the website to be 500 pages. You actually need a very good landing page that speaks specifically to that customer's needs with one call to action. That's the way to successfully do digital marketing. And so what it allows you to do is you can literally go in, and this is an example of our wealth diversified marketplace, where you can literally go in and then when the person, you can see the look and the feel of it, they literally go into the platform. It links them straight to the platform. You can literally log in you've got all the same look and feel. So if this was woman and wealth, it would all be in the pinks. And then once you get into the shop, you've got complete control of the products that are in the shop. So you can have global products, you can have real estate products, you can have ulterior, alternative investment products, but, but the shop owner gets to choose. And, and you can imagine for suppliers, although it's going to multiple different shops, they can ultimately get distribution globally, which is exactly what, what they want. So, this is just an example of some of the look and feels for millennials, women, wealth, and the Sharia compliance. What he's doing, is. I wanted before I play this, this is the CEO of Lemonway. Now, Lemonway has, it's the largest um, provider of digital wallets to crowdfunding platforms, fintech platforms, and marketplaces in Europe. They do 2 billion euros a year through their platform. And what's really interesting in is that your money is protected by European law. It took us 18 months to, to integrate with these guys. And it wasn't the technology, it was the regulation. But they're the best and the biggest backed by the top banks in Europe. And the reason we went with them is that people can put their money into their wallets forever. They don't earn it, they don't get charged any fees. And we can have multiple currencies. We can have dollars, pounds, euros, etc. This is what he had to say about Wealth Migrate. What he's what is doing with Migrate is kind of replacing the private banking um, so you, you, you put your money on, on the wallet, which is held by Lemonway, but then you can choose with Wealth Migrate um, advices and opportunities. You can choose to diversify your portfolio uh, uh, with all the, the opportunities that Wealth Migrate will be able to uh, present to you. So it's, it's, it's in a way the focus on one single thing, it is how to offer my, to my customers, uh, the, uh, the greatest investments opportunities, uh, but they focus on that, but they do not focus on one single invest, investment type. They di diversify their type of opportunities. So really, really interesting how quickly he picked up the concept of what we were doing. I wanted to share one last thing with you, which is we are launching a distressed medical opportunity with a $13 billion company. And this is what they had to say in May. You need to be commended. We think that you have created with what you've created with the digital wallets and easy aggregation of investors is a game changer. We have not seen anything like this in the market and are excited to explore how to work with you on a significant scale. So they are based out of Chicago, America, uh, London, England, and out of Europe, just to put in perspective. They got 1,300 staff. And this is what they had to say about the experience. And then finally, as Willem said, it's all driven by the purpose. It's how to make a, a create a better and more sustainable planet for all. And when, when people say, what's our purpose? I loved what you said about Tesla. Ours is to empower the 99% to be able to invest like the top 1% using technology and smart investing. And this is now, you know, when you talk about satellites and the adoption of smartphones, everyone that's on this call is in the middle class, the upper middle class, or already in the high net worth uh, genre. And that's fine. We want to be able to help everybody, but we equally want to be able to help the person with $1. But if you come back to what Willem has said all night, it's about hyper-focus. You can't have one marketplace trying to serve everyone. It does not work. It's about having that hyper-focus. And so with that, I wanted to share an opportunity with you, which we literally copied from Amazon 20 years ago. We're launching an opportunity with a convertible debt where people can participate, where we're going to pay 7 to 10%, depending on the amount that people invest, 
to be able to get interest per annum for five years. We're going to be changing the name of Wealth Migrate Limited, which is the UK holding company to the Global Wealth Group. And ultimately, we're raising $5 million, $2 million of debt, $3 million of equity for strategic acquisitions and commercial acceleration of the business within the ecosystem. We've got so many people now. I mean, COVID is so interesting to me because we were knocking on people's doors and they were sort of, yeah, we'll do it one day. Now they're knocking on our door because their business has completely and fundamentally shifted. And so we need to have the capacity to roll out globally now. We want to 10X our metrics, which will dramatically increase our valuation. And what Ken's been working on, Ken Williams, is a way to, to grow a path to do an IPO, a $100 million plus IPO. It's why we've moved to London, not only because it's the fintech capital and, and the best regulatory environment in the world, but it is much better from a, from a future IPO. The returns are based on the size of the investment. Interest is going to be paid quarterly, although if you're using the wallets, we aim to pay it monthly. And what's really important in these current times is that your capital is secured against our real estate assets. So on our balance sheet, our real estate assets are roughly $4 million. This is only $2 million, which means you've got 200% cover or a 50% loan to value, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, why are we doing it? Well, because we've got the infrastructure now, but we need to get out in front of more local and global entrepreneurs and institutions because we can help them, that we are solving their need, which is solving their customers' need. I, I heard a great comment the other day called B to B to C, which is business to business to consumer. And ultimately, it's a way to scale a global marketplace and, and exponentially grow the meta marketplace. From our perspective, we've spoken about being a venture builder. It's about onboarding fintech entrepreneurs, expanding their businesses, and ultimately helping them grow their profitability, their revenue. And by doing that, you're creating an incubation hub for marketplaces, which is growing the overall value of the Global Wealth Group. We're looking to dual list, as I said to you, with at least 100 million valuation. And then our aim is a 500 million and ultimately getting to the billion. Nothing has changed in the next five to seven years. Has it been hard? <laughs> That's an understatement, uh, the last five years. But what's interesting is that we have literally, I like to use the metaphor, a surfer cannot go to the back line, or that, sorry, they cannot sit on the beach and say, oh, look, a good wave's coming. Let me paddle out and go catch it. You actually have to be at back line when that wave comes. And that's what COVID has provided. We all knew that this decade was going to be a decade of change. We didn't think it was going to happen quite so quickly. But, you know, I believe that, that the timing is right. And, and we, we as a company are ripe to take advantage. We're looking for acquisition targets. and We can leverage that growth. So we can leverage on the worldwide, you know, wealth community, the digital technology, and ultimately increase the revenue and the profitability. What are those thresholds? Well, the silver level is $25,000. It's a 7% interest and a 3% discount on the current share price. Now, just think of it like buying Apple shares, but in five years, but agreeing the price today. Gold is 100,000. It's at 8% with a 7% discount. And the platinum is 250,000 at a 10% with, a, with class A shares and a 12% discount. Now, for just to reiterate for investors, Firstly, it's a five-year investment and it converts within five years. We're going to keep a minimum. So although we'll pay the cost, the debt cost through our revenues, we're going to keep a minimum of 24 months in a separate bank account so that those revenues or that debt or that interest, whatever you want to call it, is protected. We're also going to have the capital protected against the real estate assets. And the first 500,000 will get preferential treatment. We'll actually get an extra percentage. So seven becomes eight, eight becomes nine, 10 becomes 11. And it's also offered at the same rates for our wealth partners. And finally, if you're interested on how it's going to be you know, shared or how it's going to be invested, our CapEx is 48%. So that's continuing to, to invest in the team. Our digital products, branding and market is 24%. Our meta marketplace rollout, human capacity and OPEX is 18%. And our global compliance and corporate governance is 10%. And so what, what I'm really excited about is that we've now got these different marketplaces and you can literally go online Next week, we're going to be doing a webinar with Cashbox because they've got a product from Credit Suisse, which is a 9% cash on cash return in pounds from a bank called Credit Suisse, which you might or might not have heard of. Uh, on the platform, you've literally got the convertible debt product, you've got the private equity product. But what you can do as well 
is you can literally go along. We've created a landing page and I'll give you the links just now where you can literally go and download a fact sheet or you can literally register for a call. You can read all about it. This is a classic of what I was talking about with regards to landing pages, etc. And what I'm so excited about is that if you come back to these marketplaces, all these opportunities are now available for you where you get access. Equally, in a couple of weeks time, we're aiming for the 28th, we are launching this distressed medical opportunity. It's $100 million that is being raised, $50 million in private capital, 10 million coming from the founder himself. They're gonna go out and buy distressed medical opportunities. It's a cash on cash return of 10%. And it's then gonna be listed on the New York Stock Exchange within 12 months at a 20% discount of valuation. So you're gonna get a 20% uplift when it, when it lists. Now, you might be sitting here and going, well, Scott, you've spoken about private equity, you've spoken about structured notes, you've spoken about a distressed medical opportunity. Yes, as Ray Dalio says, the ability to diversify across assets, countries and currencies. And so in terms of the next step, you can literally go to the landing page. If you want to read all about it, you can, you, you can see the link there. You can speak to one of our wealth consultants. You know, this is not for everybody. So we want people to understand what is it about? What are the risks? What are the different levels? Does it suit you? You can go to our platform. For those of you that are a little bit more sophisticated, already on the platform or KYC and want to do it on the platform, fantastic. Go to the platform and do it. The wealth diversification marketplace. Remember, Wealth Migrate is a global real estate marketplace. So it's there for real estate. This is for all the products, including real estate and the other alternative investments. And for those of you who just want to use the old school WhatsApp, you know, it is on a first come, first serve basis for the first $500,000. And if you want to reach out directly to Lee on WhatsApp, you certainly can. So, Willem, that was my interlude in terms of taking what you've spoken about and tried to put it into reality for people. You know, one of the things that, that I liked about what you said when I met you in 2017 was you traveled the world and you've spoken a lot in theory to these big companies, big corporates, but it was very seldom you met companies. And I'm sure you've met a lot more than you've gone into the venture capital space yourself, but where people are actually doing it. And, and one of the things that I took away from Roger, which I'd like to just talk to you about before we go to the Q&A with everyone else, is that Roger talks about this whole venture builder model. And, and how it's not about, you, you spoke about the founders and, and about, call it our board and, and just our leadership team, but to actually globally scale now, it's about teams working together in ecosystems. And, and as he says, the number one way to reduce risk is actually to have the ability to scale. So, so to have multiple marketplaces with multiple asset classes and multiple income streams in multiple currencies is actually a lot safer than having one big company in one area doing one asset class. And then that's the whole idea of scale. What's your thoughts on that? Because again, that's a completely different mindset from the typical linear organic growth model. So <clears throat> you are lucky if you get double digit growth in a single revenue stream in today's world. That is just a fact. Uh, so the more revenue streams you have and diversification that allows you rich of more uh, of more volumes of consumers, the higher your likelihood of finding exponential growth. The capital markets attribute more than 70% of the share value, the, the price that it's traded at, is attributed through the perception that the market holds of your ability to grow. Not necessarily even the reality. Of course, that'll get measured in time. But the perception of your ability to grow is what drives such a large component of your share price. So, Having infrastructure and a mindset that talks to multiple consumers globally and through hyper-focus. And I actually don't see how you can be a global organization if you don't have that. Put it the other way around. And talk to me a little bit around collaboration. You know, there's a lot of talk. You spoke about convergence, but it's interesting because you kind of got convergence and collaboration. And, you know, again, the old school sort of old power model was that it was top down, you know, it's complete control. I as the CEO yes. have control over everyone. And, and yet the new power model is about community and collaboration. And, and how do you see that evolving with, with, you know, because every country has its own nuances and, and there's always local realities, but yet there's this whole global concept, you know? So I'll give you two examples <clears throat> of uh, where I see it starting to stick its head out, even in a conservative South Africa that predominantly comes from an era of 
command and conquer, hierarchical, moats, uh, NDA, restraint of trade, you know, all those sort of tools to, um, <laughs> to, uh, to, to grasp at the power. Um, during the first couple of weeks in COVID, there were a whole bunch of shops that needed to close down around the coast where the communities aren't um, metropole. And so there was an interesting case in one of my favorite towns in South Africa, which is Pittenberg Bay, where the local spa opened up shelf space and afforded artisan product manufacturers to come and sell their stuff, given that their shops had to close, but as essentials inside of the spa. And so what a wonderful little example of a microcosm, but the thinking of opening up your infrastructure to allow for what seems to be a competitor to also participate in the economy, but through doing that, lifting the tide, which of course lifts all of the boats. Um, so ecosystem thinking is starting to make, wait, make its way into the emerging economies and also in South Africa, which is wonderful news. The other example is, is uh, have you seen when you drive around the metropoles now, you find those poles that look like a half a, like a mushroom halfway through a skewer. And then what you're starting to see now is that on that, on that mushroom, there are a whole bunch, like next to the road, on those mushrooms, there are a whole bunch of cameras. So there's this Vumacam company that has now put up cameras uh, and taken the cost of infrastructure on board and rolled them out all over Joba, Cape Town, and I, I'm sure it cased it in by now as well. And um, other security companies can use their camera infrastructure through which to provide safety services and response services to consumers. So in other words, again, allowing not just for me to own the thing, but for me to open up my infrastructure, attract way more economic participation, serve the consumer with more value and see how this tide rises. No one will come out of COVID alone. It's not gonna happen. It's gonna be a team thing. You better start embedding that thinking now. My last question before I, uh, and just by the way, Lee's put up a, a poll. So we love people to interact, you know, and, uh, and get people's thoughts and opinions. And I've obviously got uh, some of the sheets in terms of how to get more, more information. But talk to me a little bit about this whole change. You know, if you take Airbnb, why Airbnb was so successful is that it's, you know, people had houses that were sitting empty and then Uber came along and they had cars that were sitting empty. And ultimately it's about assets and resources that weren't being utilized that ultimately they were able to connect. And there's this whole talk, if you take collaboration and all the sort of artificial, uh, not artificial, exponential technologies that you were talking about and, and ultimately finding and using underutilized um, assets and, and resources and ultimately being able to scale it. But I want to know your thoughts because, you know, Chad Pope, who's, who's you know, a very, um, I've got a huge amount of time for Chad and his partner, Andrew, because what, what he's done is he's been a successful businessman himself. He's invested in property and he said, like, I really want to be able to get stable, predictable income like I get in my properties. And then he was getting it through the stock market and you and I couldn't invest in it unless we had $2 million. But his mindset was exactly the same. Well, hang on but why can't I do it exactly like a property? And, and so what I wanted to, the question really was that what he's done, what we've done in medical buildings and whatever, they've now done with structured notes. What more opportunities is there in the investment financial wealth space where there are all these things that people don't even know exist? And this is what I mean by the 99% getting access to invest like the top 1%. They don't even have the access, the knowledge or, or, or the know-how to be able to participate. And now with technology and, and, and things like smart investing, they, they're getting access to it. How do you see this world changing? Because there's so much um, untapped resources. You know, there's only so many one percenters and everyone's trying to run after them. You know? oh, tough question, man. You should have prepped me for this. Um, <laughs> look, I think the claiming that you don't have knowledge is an excuse that belongs in the 1990s. The advent of internet has allowed for anyone to know anything. So just one of the arguments elements is that there are so many things that people don't know or are financially illiterate about. That excuse is starting to evaporate because access to information is available and it's available to everyone. And when Musk switch on these satellites, it's available to anyone. So um, that won't be a thing that lasts. Second, I think, as platform and ecosystem thinking starts to become more mature and proliferates deeper into economies, you're gonna find more and more people listing 
more and more variety of products. And I think so we're going to see some products that we, that we that don't have today um, and through innovation will, will, will pose new opportunities to us. Specifically as the blending of geographical borders starts to occur, we saw that with, with cryptocurrency, people used to think of Bitcoin as the way to get around the Reserve Bank, right? Um, because I can take my entire wealth portfolio, cryptize it, send it across the border and cash out. You can't stop me it's physically. And so the concept of a border um, geographically, I know that there's some, some rising of nationalism thinking in the world at the moment, which is a countermeasure for what I'm saying. But overall in time, I think you'll find that the homogeneity of people will, will congregate around not necessarily geographical areas, but around interests. So you, you won't necessarily have um, you know, South Africans because they are all from South Africa thinking that they're the same. You'll have people that think the same, that think the same, and they might be uh, eclectic in their heritage. So borders are becoming less of a thing, and that means the international flow of money is also becoming more liquid and more fluid. And that will also, I think, drive innovation. So I'm not, I'm not skirting your question, but I don't know what the other things are that we're gonna see Suffice to say, we better be on the lookout for when these cars start driving in and amongst the horses. Yeah, well, I think I think that's the point. Is that you know we we're all riding horses at the moment, and uh, it is going to change. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt. There's a question from Francis here that's probably relevant to this, and he says, "So how do you get your clients to join on an exponential journey when all your competitors are telling them to maintain their linear approach? The challenge is that you have no track record of exponential growth." So it's a pity my power and out here because I had a slide that I took baskets of companies um, in the great financial crisis. And then I indexed their revenue and market share uh, as one curve. And I also indexed their innovation spend and their marketing spend. And then I juxtaposed uh, batches of companies against each other. And what was absolutely clear was that fear, uh, lack of understanding, and perspective of negative versus opportunity grabbed a hold of a, by far the majority of companies that, are, that had been listed and they curtailed their spend of innovation and marketing because they believed that they could save themselves safely. And of course, if you look at the sort of six year uh, ensuing period, uh, what their market share had come down to like 40% of what it was before the financial crisis. And all those companies, contr uh, as a contradiction, all the companies that had supercharged their marketing and R&D spending uh, ended up with market share of 160% of what it was. So someone is going to take that space. Um, you know, and so, yeah, it's just an interesting observation as to uh, the linear mindset thing is also coupled with fear. And it's important to, to firstly become aware to Francois' question. Um, educate yourself. If you can't name the 16 technologies, you've got a problem, be able to name them more than being able to name them, understand their, what, what they're all about and how one could apply them. And in there lies the awareness around opportunity. So it's, it's about taking control of this and not waiting to be a passenger. Yeah, no, it's, look, I'm conscious of your time because of the lockdown. What's, what's it called? A curfew. Uh, <laughs> that's what I, every time someone says a curfew, I think I live in Beirut or something, you know. But, uh, yeah. but anyway, I'm conscious of your time. What, what I suggest is that um you know I, th I think it's been so valuable and in many ways tonight you've you've got people's minds thinking but i'm sure that there's going to be so much more and and as you said there's so many deep areas you can go to and i don't know what everyone else thinks tonight you know i um i've got that that eight trends webinar which is the eight exponential trends and the eight societal trends and maybe what we need to do Willem, and i'm literally putting you on the spot here but maybe what we need to do is in a month's time or something revisit this and and go deeper you know so we 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 say right okay we dealt with the top level now how do we actually go deeper and some of the more applications people could do and maybe what we'll do is if people you know want to send through questions or whatever we can actually rather than sort of a one-way presentation actually do you know more of a, a kind of a q a um i think that's a great it's a great idea you know but, uh, <laughs> i mean no, i'm very happy to do that scott uh, fully on board and that would be really great if people can guide us as to what it is that they, that they think they want to know more about. Because for, for everyone that's not presenting tonight, uh, however many hundred there are, um, it's actually daunting sitting on this side of the screen, hoping that what you're saying finds resonance with someone and a bit of guidance as to um, what the interest points are or the areas that we, we could elaborate more would be wonderful. And I'd be very willing to do that, Scott. 
Oh, brilliant. And I think, you know, if people want to type it now or give us feedback, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm also, it's always a challenge because Willem and I, and we joked about it last night, we both love talking and there's lots we want to share. We can talk for three hours, basically. But we also wanted to keep it short. And it's so difficult to take all this knowledge and to cut it into an hour or two. So, you know, we, maybe if people can give us guidance as to whether they want to do one or two webinars or whether we should maybe just do a workshop that's three hours long or whatever. I don't know. Like in terms of, you know, one of the things that I'm... Um, that I've always been intrigued with with Willem is I'm trying to get him onto our board um, and as an advisor because his, his knowledge, not only of where the world's going, but also the financial landscape is so valuable. And, and those are the type, that's the thinking you need in a business. You know, you, yes, you need the perseverance, but crisis, you know, it's going to be strategy that wins at the end of the day, which I think is, is, is so critical. And what I'm, the only reason I'm saying that is that, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm dumping a lot on you and I apologize for that. But I'm also finding ways where how can we add more value to, to the community? You know, equally what you're doing with Offernet and all. I mean, there's so many exciting collaborative stuff we're talking about. And, and I think what I'm just trying to get across to the community is it's literally the tip of the iceberg of what we're talking about and what's possible in the coming weeks. Scott, can I just say, because I've had some absence from Wealth Migrates and this is not a paid for punt. I mean this and you know, I'll be candid. From what I've seen when last I was involved to now, the maturity curve has increased fundamentally. It's, it's, it's almost not recognizable. I think that turbine hall meeting was momentous. And what I'm seeing here is the right thinking and infrastructure, both, and, and team. So three elements that has the potential, not the, not necessarily guaranteed, nothing's guaranteed, but the potential to go global exponential. Um, so I really, really, this is a, is a wonderful opportunity. Thanks for having me on board and, and bringing it to, to the market. Uh, I hope we can do this. And um, I certainly believe we've got the team for it. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate that. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, um, to, I'm going to lock up. What I would suggest is uh, let's say cheers to you so that you don't get uh, arrested. By Court. <laughs> I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll load up the, I'll load up the webinar. Any questions that we've got, I'll, I'll bounce through to the next uh, the next webinar. We Wonderful. Do. Thank you for uh, for understanding my time constraint on this side. Thanks, everyone. I saw some of the comments flip through here. Very, very nice for you to do that. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for organizing, Scott. Thanks for having me. I'm going to run so that I don't get caught. Have a good night, no. everyone. Be safe, Willem. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Lee, I've just got a couple of things, a couple of comments, a couple of questions, and I just wanted to wrap up for everyone. So uh, what time frame are you looking to include the low-income groups? And see, really good question, because you know what's really interesting? If you look at this diagram that I've got on the right-hand side, we could actually launch Wealth Create tomorrow morning, literally tomorrow morning. We've got the technology, we've got the infrastructure, we've got the digital capabilities, we've got the digital wallet, we've got everything. We need teams. We need, we need committed teams that can focus on single aspects. And so whether it's women in wealth, whether it's millennials in wealth, whether it's Wealth Create, which is the, you know, the, the nought to $1,000, it's about teams and that's why this, this uh, convertible debt and meta marketplace and, and rollout is, is so important. It's, it's no longer about having the technology, it's about having the strategy, the infrastructure and the execution. Um, please recommend funding PTYs for startups. Uh, Len, I'm not quite sure uh, what that uh, question is. Um, someone else said um, they would like to invest with smaller amounts. Uh, my, my suggestion is reach out to your wealth consultants, chat about it, let them understand what you're looking at. There are reasons we've got thresholds because uh, it is, you know, a fairly high level sophisticated investment. We need to make sure people know what they're investing in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think more of this will be helpful. I feel that I've been given a peep through a window. The 16 technologies to watch is an important bit of advice and we'll be seeing that. The picture will help to take shape, but at a broad level, I'm getting it. So thanks very much, Rachel. And I think one of the things that certainly many of our wealth partners, which is what we call our, our, our shareholders, our wealth partners, have gained a lot of benefit from me included, is that over the last five years, we expose each other to it. We've got you know, a WhatsApp group for exponential technology. We've got digital real estate. We've got cryptocurrency and blockchain. And that's why I believe very strongly in growing and, and a like-minded community in terms of where it's going. So let's just look here. Um, We've got all the, so thanks for all the positive comments. I'm not going to read them all out, but uh, um, you've scratched the surface and must go deeper. Future webinars would be great. Uh, you would grow hyper speed of light. Uh, da, 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 da. Thank you very much. 
will be able to watch the replay of the webinar, definitely. We, we were recording it. Enjoying the insights. would like to hear more around the 16 technologies. Love the presentation. Excellent. So I think, Lee, we've, we've, uh, we've covered everyone's presentations. I'd like to just give everyone a bit of a conclusion. And that is that you know, Amazon is one of the most successful businesses that's ever existed. And we can learn a lot from how they started, what they did, what they did in the, you know, in the crash 20 years ago when they were five years old. We are literally in the exact same period, five or six years old. They were five or six years old. Um, the converging of trends that Willem has spoken about and Wealth 5.0, it's happening whether we like it or not. It, it's happening right before our eyes and we get to you know, ignore it, we get to do nothing about it or we get to participate in it. Really, that's the choice. I always say to people that in the last crash, I started out tonight and I said there were three things that I learned. Income is critically important. That's why we're doing a convertible debt so that people can earn income. Having cash to be able to execute, not just to buy medical buildings, distressed medical buildings like I spoke about with the opportunity coming, but to buy businesses, strategic partnerships to merge. It's a way to grow a lot faster than just through organic growth. And then these opportunities come up literally every 10 years. And you get to decide, are you gonna wait for the next one? I know that I didn't take enough opportunity 10 years ago. I've spent 10 years building Wealth Migrate ready for this opportunity. And then why do people want to become shareholders or investors in this group? The first is that they want to make a profit. You know, our target is to 10x your return within a, within a five to seven year period. Our global community, they want to be part of a global community. They want to be with people like Willem. They want to learn. They want to grow. They want to invest with like-minded people. And finally, they want to have a purposeful impact. You know, I spoke about our purpose, solving one of the biggest challenges on the planet, allowing the 99% to invest like the top 1% using technology and smart investing. And then finally, what is the definition of luck? Well, it's when preparation meets opportunity. And, and I just feel, you know, our digital wallets went live in April, <laughs> literally at the same time as COVID was all happening. And it's just, you know, we've been preparing for this literally for 10 years. And now that opportunity has arrived. To finish off, there's an African proverb. If you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk together. And as Al Gore said, this is a massive challenge that we need to solve. And if you're solving people's problems, it's equally a significantly good business opportunity. And so we invite you on a journey to walk far, to walk together, but we need to walk fast. And that's why we need knowledge from people like Willem so that we can increase our knowledge, we can increase our understanding, we cannot be scared of what's happening in the current market, but we can actually see it as an opportunity. That's all for me. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Lee, for organizing again tonight. Thank you for everyone being online. We had so many people booked tonight. I know Lee had a problem because the room got full. And so some people are going to have to watch a, a recording, which is a lovely problem to have. So thank you, Lee, and well organized. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, Willem is a treat as you can see by all the comments. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight. I'm sure that you got massive value and I will definitely be pushing Willem and Scott to get the next lot of uh, webinars into our diaries. As Scott said, we had a full Zoom webinar tonight and we had people that couldn't get in, which is a first for us, but it is an absolutely fabulous problem to have. I will be reaching out to them tomorrow and um, next time, hopefully they'll join the webinars sooner but thank you everybody have a fantastic evening be safe wherever you are be warm if you're out in the cold be cool if you're out in the warm um take care and reminder sorry Lee, and just a reminder that next week we're doing the webinar with uh with chad pope and and andrew mobsby around uh, structured notes and and the new way of investing which is another product which is coming up on the wealth uh, diversification marketplace and the week after that we've got the ceo and founder of the $13 billion company uh, talking about what they are going to be focusing on. I mean, they've got 1,300 staff in, in America, England, and Europe. What are they going to be focusing on for the next 12 months? So we've got two very exciting weeks of webinars coming up, and uh, I'd suggest you don't miss out. Absolutely. We will be sending further details out, so please look out in our various WhatsApp groups, our Telegram groups. Look out in your email. Um, if it doesn't come to your inbox, it will definitely be in your spam or junk folder. Um, but we look forward to seeing you on our upcoming webinars. Take care, everybody. Good night. Good night.